Greetings to everyone here and to all of you online. The Friday Night Lecture Series is one of our oldest activities, and our Cook and Eat program is also one of our oldest activities, so we're delighted tonight to have the two of them join forces. Uh, our presenters are going to be from the um, committee. Um, no, that's great. Sandra Nelson Miller, uh, Pam Hankins, and Barb Randall from the committee are here, and they are going to share uh, the traditions and future of Nordic cooking. If you've ever taken a cooking class from the Cook and, Eat, Cook and Eat group, these are the ladies who are the masterminds of uh, how all of that is done. If you haven't taken one, it's worth doing sometime because it's just a lot of fun. So having said that, um, Sandra, Barb, and Pam, it's all yours. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you for being here tonight. We're very excited that you are interested in what interests and excites us. So. Um, I guess we'll, uh, I'll start, and we each have a kind of a separate section, and we'll be talking about different aspects of uh, cook and eat, from the very micro level here to the very worldwide level. Um, so, some of you may not know that uh, Nordic Northwest was not always called Nordic Northwest. We started uh, as the Scandinavian Heritage Foundation in the late 70s um, and with a dream to provide for not only the people of Nordic Heritage an opportunity to learn and expand their knowledge, but to make it available to anybody who had an interest in all things Nordic. Um, and our original founders were Joanna and Bernard Fede, who were a Norwegian couple of great intellect and commitment and dedication. So uh, Priscilla Blumel was our very first um, executive director, and she joined us, I think, in maybe the early 80s. I don't have the exact date. She was our first director, and she was a very creative thinker. Uh, let me see. I think I might even have a picture of her. Ah, there okay. she is. She... Uh, fell in love with the Nordic culture and all of the people that were uh, members of this organization. And I would say that probably the greater percentage of these people were either first or second generation immigrants and therefore very closely tied to their roots. And clearly they also brought their own food traditions with them. Um, I can imagine that must have been their comfort food. And it must have been a bit frustrating when they could not find what they needed to make what was indigenous to them. That said, they learned to adapt recipes based on local ingredient availability and a lack of Nordic ingredients and products, many of which today are easily obtained uh, that makes life more interesting. Um, I also think that bringing your food traditions with you as an immigrant is at least a one small way to keep, to keep yourself close to your heritage. And maybe in, when you are feeling very homesick, making that um, lobskous uh, Norwegian soup is going to make you feel better at the end of the day. So um, Priscilla noticed this and she said, you know what, I have an idea. She said, I think we need to start a cook and eat class because it just makes sense, right? It brings people together. And she said, we're gonna cook it and then we're gonna eat it. And boy, that sounds like fun to me. <laughs> and I think we can say all these years later, mm -hmm. it is it still is, fun. Very fun. It is a lot of fun. 
So with her brilliant idea in the mid 80s, her dream was realized. They started their first classes uh, because we didn't have any uh, office or cultural center at that time. They started the classes at a Danish cultural house on Southwest Barber Boulevard, so not so very far away from here. And I can remember attending some of those classes and some of the people that were uh, attending and visiting and cooking um, are still with us today. Some of us sadly are not. But nevertheless, the classes were instantly popular. And that led to the next phase of Cook and Eat. And that was to develop a cookbook. Now, uh, an incredible woman, another incredible woman who happened to be, happens to be Danish. Let's see if she's going to go. Oops. Oops. Okay, I will have a picture of her in a minute. Kaya Voldbeck. I know some of you know her. She's Danish. Um, and uh, parenthetically, I should say that Kaya uh, is going to be celebrating her 100th birthday this July. So this is kind of her celebratory year. And uh, she has a much better, sharper brain than I do. And uh, she's just a fantastic woman. She took on the project of developing the very first cookbook. And this was the very first cookbook, Scandinavian cookbook. Now, they had a method to their madness because it was, they thought, okay, so we're going to do all this great cooking. Let's get something out of this beyond that. Well, what was that? Portland State had a Scandinavian language and culture program. The classes were taught, uh, language classes were taught there, and all of those who taught were volunteers. So they thought, well, if we make this cookbook and we sell the cookbook, and maybe some of the proceeds from our cookbook classes can go to help support the Portland State uh, language program that was specific to the Nordic countries. So that's what they did. I thought that was a really um, far-thinking and generous uh, contribution to expanding Nordic cultural interest, and I applaud them for their effort. Um, so, it was in the mid-1980s that they started the Cook and Eat program at the school. They created their cookbooks. And let's see what is next. Uh, that's that's uh, the explanation I just gave you about uh, supporting Portland State. So I'll leave that there for just a second. You guys can take a look at that. Okay, I'm gonna flip it. <laughs> and there is Kaya in her folk dress. And she looks just about the same. Yeah. She does. She just hasn't aged today, I swear. Um so most of our home cooks shared the recipes of Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Sweden, Faroe Islands, and probably some other smaller Nordic islands that I don't even know about. But the initial bakers and cooks included Kaya, who was from Denmark, Kaino Lethem, who was from Finland, Edda Sigador, who was from Iceland, Jean Ockrey, who uh, was smart enough to marry a Norwegian man. <laughs> Edda, uh, Alberta Serstad, who uh, has Norwegian heritage with, I think, a little bit of Finn thrown in. So too. <laughs> and Lisa Lowenberg from Sweden. Now, that's just a drop in the bucket. Uh, but they were very instrumental in creating the success of this program. In addition to having these women and men and others, we also have presented professional chefs and bakers that bring additional expertise for our attendees. 
uh, eventually the Danish center moved further away from us, and so we used several locations throughout city until Nordia House opened its doors in 2018. But previously, uh, uh, Priscilla retired in 2004, and our new executive director, Mike O'Brien, don't be fooled by O'Brien because he is uh, pretty Swedish, actually. He brought an added talent of cooking and baking, and he taught a number of classes. Uh, and he, he kind of had his two favorites. He loved to teach gravlocks, which always sells out, and he loves to make Swedish limpa bread, which if you've had one piece, you just don't stop there, right? Mm -hmm. Then eventually, we in, uh, came to us a wonderful woman named Paula Corbridge, who had Danish heritage. She became our committee chair. And then Paula moved to Seattle, at which point, Alberta Serstad led the group until her passing last year. So she led this group for perhaps close to 10 years. Um, I should say that the entire 22-23 cooking season has been dedicated to Alberta and her extraordinary 30 plus years of service to cook and eat. We'll never forget her. Now I'm going to just show you a few more photos. So that's the second edition. Um, they're both out of print. I know that our committee has kicked around the ideas of trying to do a new cookbook, um, but we just haven't quite got that off the ground. And that is Alberta making um, a an apple pie, probably. Uh, Norwegian themed, I think. And then a little shout out to our good friend Marion Thompson, who loves to carve watermelons. And so this is a cook and eat themed watermelon uh, at one of our classes that um, you can see the Swedish chef back there. <laughs> and um, also, uh, when Alberta passed, uh, Marion made uh, a watermelon especially for her service. That was in October, I believe. Yeah. This is Mike O'Brien in the process of uh, preparing Gravlox. Uh, does anybody not know what Gravlox is? I don't see any hands raised. Okay, <laughs> this is good. These are some of the terribly delicious temptations. Uh, there's uh, uh, the ones in front, I think, are filled with lingon. Isn't it the mandel moussar? Yeah, mandel moussar, which Alberta, that was one of her specialties. And that's your honey Yes, to the, to the one, to the one in the, to the right of uh, the smaller platter, those are the Swedish honey boats. Um, and then I don't know what the ones in the back are, but they are all uh, variations on a theme. You can't go wrong with any of them, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> and this is called uh, Kr Kringla. No, 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 this is Kr Kringla. I know it doesn't look quite like the Danish Kringla because it's not complete yet, but this was taught by just a couple of months ago by Thor Eriksson, who, while he is mostly Norwegian, he is very interested in Danish cooking. He is a culinary educator down by Bend, and he has been working with a Danish culinary institute in Denmark for about the past five years and they've been doing exchanges and uh, I believe they will be back uh, this spring, the Danish students. And they are doing absolutely stunningly beautiful work and hopefully they'll be doing a dinner that we'll be uh, selling tickets for. So there's my little advertisement for Danish cooking. Um, and 
Oh, yes, Barb is going to talk some more about the Danish cooking later, what he did with that. This is our, our good friend, Jean Ockrey, set up to teach a Lefse class. Lefse is a Norwegian flatbread, potato flatbread. And um, that's a hands-on class where people have the chance to roll out the lesa, which may be a little trickier than you first think, and then, and then cooking it on very large, round, flat griddles. Sometimes we have ended up having to have three lefse classes in a year. <laughs> yeah. Now, Jean has um, moved to the Midwest. We have another wonderful chef, Kari Tertadian, who teaches lefse for us now, and she also makes extremely excellent lefse. So I think that is all I have to tell you right now, and we're going to pass it on to Pam. Thanks, Sandra. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the cook and eat, I'm going to be talking a little bit about the traditional um, cook and eat uh, planning. What we do when we're coming up with our season is we think about a lot of the traditional um, classes and traditional foods that people want to learn to make. Um, so we uh, try and do that as well as have, re since we represent all five of the um, Scandinavian countries, we try and have a represent representation from each as well. Um, as you can hear from all of us, we're passionate about doing this and it's fun. Um, we love to learn, cook, share our knowledge. And if we can't, don't know how to do it, or we find somebody who can, as you heard her say, we've had chefs, we've had uh, home cooks, we've, where however we can do it to bring classes to for everybody to enjoy. Um, traditions in families helps to strengthen the family bond as well as it provides a sense of comfort and security. Um, it's also a great way to pass on your culture. It's a great way to stay tied with, as in my family, it was called the old country and uh, connects generations. Um, my grandparents taught me, um, they taught my parents and, you know, I'm, I taught mine and hopefully at some point they'll they'll keep passing that on as well and they learn to look forward to different things like at Christmas I the Scandinavian um, cardamom bread I can't make it fast enough um, history as in most cultures, uh, food comes from what can be grown, hunted, and what's available in the area based on climate and resources. We're going to go all the way back to the Vikings. Um, they f fished, they made stews, uh, turnips were found, um, and remnants of turnips were found in, in some of the archaeological places, and they made flatbread. Also because of the proximity um, in the Scandinavian countries to the ocean, uh, fish and fishing were very plentiful, especially salmon and and cod. A lot of root vegetables, and I'm going to give a shout out for our April class. We're going to be talking about uh, rhubarb, which is not a root vegetable, but it's a cold one that um, comes in the spring, and uh, rutabaga. And uh, so they eat beets, turnips, potatoes, rutabaga. In the summer, lots and lots of berries. Have any of you guys been over there in the summer and had cloudberries? And, <laughs> yep, they're strawberries, huge strawberries. Um, lingonberries, strawberries, cloudberries, uh, apples in the fall. And the only nut that grows in the Scandinavian country are hazelnuts, and the rest are all um, imported. The meats, uh, pork, lamb, uh, beef, and then, of course, cheese of all kinds. The uh, Nordic cuisine is uh, about fresh ingredients, about what they had, what they could use, what they fished right out of the fjords. Um, it's more about the fresh ingredients than covering things with sauces, etc. Uh, but it features a variety of simple yet classic flavor profiles, which when combined pr uh, provide hearty, satisfying meals. The foods that originated in the Scandinavian countries are cloudberries, lingonberries, Princess cake, the Swedish princess cake, we had a class of that at one point, is yummy. Elk, reindeer, lutefisk, which I think some of us wish had not come from there. Um, <laughs> Gravlax, uh, which um, Mike does a beautiful job of teaching, but when it was first done, it was buried in the ground. Uh, Yedost, um, what came from the Gubernsdal region of Norway, and Prostost is a Swedish cheese uh, from the 16th and 19th century. They paid their tithes to churches in dairy products, and they would spoil. And so they found that making the cheese um, solved that problem. 
the Nordic countries are also known f especially for their techniques of drying, curing, smoking, salting, and pickling. Uh, beef was for festive occasions and was a symbol of wealth. Uh, pork was typically for holidays, but also used year round. Lamb was uh, harvested in the fall and then dried, salted, cured, and eaten pretty much all year round. Cakes and cookies were also a symbol of wealth. I grew up in a um, very traditional Nordic, uh, with very traditional Nordic fare. My grandmother came from, I, well, all four of my grandparents came, um, I'm second generation on all sides, um, from Norway and Sweden, and uh, my grandmother's family had a hotel, the Sievertsen Hotel at the time, it's now called Gluppen Hotel. So I brought this with to show it was based on salmon, it has a salmon run associated with it as well as it's right there on the fjord. Many, many people came and uh, for years and years it actually came started with people coming from England mostly to uh, take advantage of doing the salmon fishing so it's got some gorgeous pictures of uh, that area um, in addition I was very fortunate and I'm going to keep this in a bag because it can, you can see I don't it's very very old this is my grandmother's sister's cookbook and it is written in Norwegian uh, their beautiful handwriting um, and I've been uh, going through slowly but surely and um, translating it, but it's been difficult because of not only the dialect from that area, but she also uh, spent quite a bit of time in Denmark. So I think there's a little Danish in there too. So, and the older weights and measures, I had to do some research to figure all that out too, but it's been, it's been pretty fun. Um, some traditional meals that uh, you may find breakfast is uh, simply, can be as simple as an open-faced slice of rye bread with butter and or sliced egg, ham, gravlax, et cetera, or it can be a table just loaded, uh, cold scrambled eggs, pity panna, which are small pieces in a pan, uh, which is uh, small pieces of meat and potatoes, etc. cetera, gravlux, sliced meats, cheeses, breads, pancakes, which the Scandinavian pancakes are a little bit more like crepes, um, breads and uh, waffles, and always, always coffee. Um, Middog was dinner in the middle of the day, which has changed now because they use they, they eat their uh, larger meal later, um, as, as does a lot of people. However, you can still find, um, my grandparents did it in the middle of the day, but they were retired at that point. But um, they... Uh, the Scandinavian countries still eat their larger meal earlier than most of the other countries in the world. Um, but dinner can be meatballs, forakal, which is a, a Scandinavian, um, it's the Norwegian, considered to be the Norwegian national dish. It's lamb and cabbage, and it's warm, and for all this snow and stuff that we've had, oh my gosh, it's a hug for your tummy. <laughs> um, Lapskaus, pea soup, how many had pea soup Thursdays? And then Swedish pea soup, yellow peas, we just had heli um, do Finnish pea soup, which are whole dried green peas. Um, so there's, you know, so differences within that. Very good fish soup, Finnish salmon soup, sausages, uh, fiskeballer. And then dinner was called Little Dinner, and it was a light fare, usually at the end of the day, open face sandwiches, a small cup of soup, cheeses, etc. Then there's smorgasbord, uh, which typically used for entertaining and the holidays. And it could be very small and simple, or it could be um, large and elaborate. And we did a class, oh gosh, it's been a couple of years back that we put on a s'more board and had, well, we did two. We had one that we worked with Broder, but the other one was done um, as more of a formal one. And your first round is herring and cheese. Second are fish dishes. Third are meats. Fourth, hot buffet with salty and a mild uh, dish and then the last uh, was uh, was sweet, whether it's fruit compote or cookies and cakes, etc. And of course, coffee. And how many people have heard of come for coffee and cake? That's a <laughs> Scandinavian tradition everywhere I have been, come for coffee and cake. And uh, Sweden, fika. And we hear a lot about it now. It's just... Fika and Huga, and uh, come for coffee and cake, and there's all sorts of different cakes to try. Holidays all have traditional food. Lent, Fastelovenballer um, for Denmark and Norway, Semla in Sweden. Easter, eggs. Um, many times uh, Easter is 
spent last going to cabins. It's the last ski weekend over in Norway. And so a lot of times that becomes more of a family fair thing. Uh, eggs are typically involved. In my home, we had my, what we called egg lure dog, which translates to egg Saturday. I have not researched if that's really a thing or if that was a thing in my family. But the Saturday before Easter, my dad egg lure dog and we had eggs. <laughs> <laughs> then there were um, Sutton and my midsummer and and Blutkaka, Kavad for Cake, which is Verdun's best day or the world's best cake. And then the, one of the things that um, I had a lot when I was over there are the heart-shaped waffles. Make them just a tiny bit sweeter and use them as strawberry shortcake. So you use the waffles as the cake. And boy, I'll tell you, by the end of that summer, wow, did I have a lot of that. <laughs> Uh, Lucia, Swedish, um, patron saint of the blind, and uh, Lucia saffron buns. Uh, Christmas Eve, uh, typically pork. Uh, could be uh, skin castec or riba, lutefisk again. Potatoes, sirkal, ulacaca, uh, pickled beets and cucumbers, kransakaka, and glug. Glug, um, the recipe we use here, we serve it every year for our Christmas cookies in November. And it is a recipe that Maritha Rufus was so great, gracious in allowing us to use. And she won the glug tasting contest. And so that's the one we use. So hopefully you guys will come and, and uh, give it a try. It's wonderful. And in preparation for Christmas, one of the things um, that are known throughout the Scandinavian countries is called Siv Slug Smolkaka. And it translates to seven types of cookies. Um, the number seven is to bring good luck. And uh, the number seven, as we know, has mythological as well as religious connotations and is considered if you make less than seven cookies, a hostess makes less than seven, she doesn't have enough. And if she makes more than seven, she has way too much. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, some of the originals were uh, Krumkaga and Goro, which date back a thousand years. I have um, my grandmother brought this when she came over from Norway. This is our crumb kaka iron. And take a look at that. It's actually, I had to, now that with the ceramic tops on the stoves, I had to actually get a separate burner so I wouldn't crack it. Um, but I still use it. However, I have actually broken down and gotten an electric one as well. It makes it a little faster, but that's still my favorite. I feel like I'm channeling my relatives. Um, let's see. So Krumkaga and Goro, and they are actually wa the oldest and also waffle related and how they're made and, and where they originated. Fatiman, Smoltringer, which are as a donut. Berliner Kranzer, which... Sandra makes the best, sambuckles and uh, syrup snipper, which are more like a ginger cookie. But there's many, many others. Um, Serenacaca Yolo Tortu, which is Finnish. Pepacaga Spritz, which is a fantastic cookie to start making with, you know, children, grandchildren, etc. cetera. Um, rosettes. And, you know, I... I I think it's great to make all Scandinavian cookies, but there's a few in our repertoire that are not that we just absolutely love. So I, ju I just go with the seven cookies. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that we each brought some of our favorite cookbooks with for you guys to um, peruse. So um, afterwards, feel free. Um, as you can see, I have another one in a plastic bag that was uh, probably the second cookbook I got, and I have used that a ton. Um, so with that, uh, Barb is going to talk about where all of this is going. Very good. I'm going to sneak this from you. Thank you. Well, I hope you've had time or will take time after our presentation to review the new Nordic cuisine information out there. It's an excellent display and explains in more detail than what I'll be able to do in our short time together here, but it's really a, a great, something you should be really proud of when you go through and see it. So 50 years ago, Alice Waters, you remember Alice Waters, our chef in Berkeley, California, she opened Shays Panisse, and it was intended to be a place where friends and neighbors could gather around the table, eat good food, and exchange ideas about politics, art, and culture. The restaurant served one set menu a day, it changed daily, 
daily, highlighting local ingredients that were ripe and ready in season. So she was training us to eat with the seasons at that time. In pursuit of that focus, she and her cooks ended up um, at the doorsteps of some small organic farmers who were growing favorable heirloom varieties of fruits and vegetables or raising heritage breeds of animals. Over time, the restaurant built up a diverse network of these ethical local suppliers, ranchers, fishers, orchardists, foragers, farmers, and backyard gardeners. They all practice regenerative agriculture and take care of the land. A next decade in the 1980s, Carlo Petrini of Italy founded the international slow food movement. He first became prominent um, for taking part in a campaign against the fast food chain McDonald's, opening a location near the Spanish Steps in Rome. That was really his impetus to get things going with that. Both of these philosophies are kind of the framework for the new Nordic cuisine. They um, focus on eating locally produced foods, which benefit the environment, the producers, and those who eat them. As a result, we all enjoy farm-to-table dinners. I'm sure you've experienced them. We grow gardens, we preserve foods for later enjoyment, and feel better about how what we eat impacts the environment and those who provide our foods. It's a philosophy we're seeing um, grow throughout in, po in popularity throughout the world. In New Nordic Cuisine, that was launched by Klaus Meyer and Rene Red Zeppi. That's kind of a hard name, R-E-D-Z-E-P-I. <laughs> they founded Noma, which is a mashup of Nordsk Mod, which is Danish for Nordic Foods, in Copenhagen in 2003. And their focus with their restaurant was to focus on foraging, invention, and new interpretations of classic Nordic foods or traditional Nordic foods. Meyer's focus, he started thinking, what will it take to become one of the greatest food regions in the world? And to that end, he invited 13 different chefs throughout the Nordic countries to come together to build a manifesto. They spent 18 hours hashing over their their thought process with the whole thing. So, um, which I think is tremendous that they could be in a room and focus on that for that long and then come up with what they did. It was really incredible. So let's take a look at what they, what they did here. Oops, I'm going back the wrong way. <laughs> So, oh, these are some of the chefs, and I'll come back to them in a minute. I want to get to the manifesto, and then we'll come back. So can you hear me if I turn this way and read to you a little bit? The manifesto has 10 points to it, and the first is starting at the top, to express the purity, freshness, simplicity, and ethics we wish to associate to our region, to reflect the changes of the season in the meal we make, to base our cooking on ingredients and produce produce whose characteristics are particular to our climates, landscapes, and waters, to combine the demand for good taste with modern knowledge of health and well-being, to promote Nordic products and the variety of Nordic producers, and to spread the word about their underlying cultures, to promote animal welfare and a sound production process in our seas, on our farmland, and in the wild to develop potentially new applications of traditional Nordic food products, to combine the best in Nordic cookery and culinary traditions with impulses from abroad, to combine so local self-sufficiency with regional sharing of high quality products, and to join forces with consumer representatives, other cooking craftsmen, agriculture, fishing, food, retail and wholesale industries, researchers, teachers, politicians, and authorities on this project for the benefit and advantage of everyone in the Nordic countries. So that's the manifesto. Now let's go back to, sorry, there we go. These are some of the people who signed it. Down in the bottom is Klaus Myers. Um, and here is his cookie, the partner in Noma with him, um, Rene Redzepi. I love that crab. I just can't, I, when I found that photo, I said, man, that's bigger than some children. <laughs> <laughs> At the top, um, that would be our left. <laughs> Let's see. That's Roger Malman. He's a chef, and I don't remember which country he was. But he his philosophy was that Nordic food 
needed to be clean with an original flavor. And during, you know, he was cooking with a lot of fish and was really trying to stay with the Nordic flavors, but could not give up lemons because, of, you know, they had such a great bright taste with the fish. So he allowed himself to keep with lemons. He was given um, his local produce uh, distributor, brought him German onions during Norway's onion season, and he asked him why. And the producer, the delivery person said, well, it's because of the cost. You know, it's going to cost you a lot to get Nordic onions. But he was adamant that he wanted to use the local, and that was that was uh, important that he would be faithful to highlighting the local produce available, regardless of the cost. Um, he also thought that, you know, there's so many wonderful flavors in the foods that we have, the simple foods, like, you know, there aren't, most Nordic recipes are very simple. They don't have a list of 21 ingredients. It's going to be maybe three or five Four or five. very, yeah. yeah. Lamb, it's, cabbage, there you water, go. Yeah. and pepper. That's, <laughs> that's what you get, and it's what gives those beautiful, clean flavors. He wanted that to be the case and didn't want, um, there was evidently some recipe that he was thinking that he wasn't going to make it, but he was saying salmon should not be rolled in cinnamon. You don't do that to salmon. Just cook it. And then there was lamb that he um, said was raised near the water. And he said, you can taste the seaweed in the meat. So he really wanted people to be able to experience what the flavors really tasted like in right there, natural. You know, that was wonderful. Um, let's see who else we have. Matthias is down in the middle here. This nice looking guy right there. He would have customers come to his restaurant and they have had already having already read the manifesto and so excited to experience it for himself. He could see that that was a really big plus for the industry as a whole because people were getting involved with it and supporting them because they were working so strongly on it. Other people that we have. Oh, this is um, Lauren. Um, Leif Sorensen, and he was in the um, islands, the Faroe Islands, and here he is foraging for whatever he's finding out there. He's got some greens here, but that's exciting to see what, what they can pull up. You know, that's one of the things on my bucket list, forage in the woods for whatever I can find for dinner. <laughs> and this is uh, Michael Bjork. I think I've identified everybody there so we can move forward. Oh, that's backward. Okay, so what? Um, while they're doing their manifesto, while they're creating that and launching that, oh, this is more interesting than the words, the discussions are happening all around the world, particularly in the U.S. and in the U.K. and Australia. So all of these people are focusing on food and how to best promote it and how to set up the guidelines of what will really make it sing for the people there. You know, they want it to be local. They want it to be tasty, healthful, ethically produced. And the only country that produced a manifesto was Norway. Excuse me. Scandinavia, forgive me, the, the Nordic countries. <laughs> and the manifesto, that proved to be the big success of the program, and it allowed Nordic chefs to become what they called the crusaders for the, a better world. So it is said that the Nordic New Cuisine Manifesto had the... Um, exerted more influence on the industries on a scale that only a few chefs and restaurants in history have achieved. It's been that powerful. When you, um, in 2014, it was seen as a res revolution, and today it's undisputable that it was successful. If you go out and review the materials there, you can see where they have taken their manifesto and shared it with other countries and allowed them to benefit just that much more with the with the guidelines that they put in. Those guidelines are, are working in other countries. There's a, a information about a Bolivian project that they have that it's, you know, just impacting people around the world. Noma, the restaurant, is, if you visit their website, which is noma.dk, you can see what they are doing around the world. It's not just in Copenhagen. They have expanded worldwide to take their programs to help people and to, so that we're all eating healthfully and 
sustainably. ethically and sustainably too. That's that's really the whole thing. So um, that's the excitement of the new Nordic cuisine. I, I think it's fascinating. And you know, we had in even in our class that Thor taught about the. Oh, Kringla. Kringla. Yes, mm -hmm. he made, it's traditionally a sweet dish, but he also made it as a savory. And that's just kind of, you know, a new twist of the, you know, the new Nordic cuisine to bring with that. And it was fabulous. It was, it was really, really good. good. Mm -hmm. Yes. So at the, you know, I want to talk about our few classes that we made a couple plugs on. Next, um, the 13th of March will be our Bergen Easter chicken and the cucumber salad. I think we still have seats there. And then we have April is our tribute to Alberta with her. She had a love for rutabagas and rhubarb. So that's what's on the menu. I can't tell you what we're cooking yet because it's a surprise, but I know it will be delightful. And then hopefully May's class will be um, the our connection with Thor in at the culinary school in Bend that we would have the Danish students come and do something and watch for a dinner there too. We are very grateful for you to be here tonight and we're also very grateful for all the support we get from the Nordic Northwest team back here. Way to go guys. And, um, and Broder too. They're very, they're sisters in our back pocket. We just love working with them. So thank you very much. Yeah. And I think we should give a little shout out too because um, our wonderful lady to my right or your left perhaps, Sonia Haugen has taught several cook and eat classes right. for us as well. And she has total mastery over pula, pula. which is a cardamom sure. bread. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a number one. Very yeah. good. Thank you for that. My uh, daughter and son-in-law make equally good All right. pull up. So I have to get them to do See, some teaching. Yeah, you pass it on. Mm -hmm. Pass, pass on. it on, tradition. <laughs> well, this has been a great evening, and thank you for so much for the presentation. We have a little time if you have questions. Any comments? concerns, whatever. I will tell you that growing up uh, in a Norwegian household, that uh, there was always the joke about the Norwegian cooking was all white. You had white fish, white bread, uh, white, white, well, white, white sauce. Uh, some of the vegetables were white, maybe a little you know, yellow or orange, but uh, desserts were white, lots and lots and lots of whipping cream, yeah. milk, uh, dairy products, everything was white. So it's, it really is a revolution to see what's happening now with Nordic cuisine. And, and I'm most familiar, of course, with Norway, but um, you see it all over. One of the things that I experienced last summer in Norway is that uh, weekends now our Friday night and Saturday night are devoted to pizza and tacos. <laughs> and every Friday night, the families are buying um, frozen pizza and the mixings for tacos. And it is an institution now in the country for Friday night, Saturday night, tacos and pizza. And there's a little company, but not so little anymore, uh, in Stranda, um, which is a little town, used to be famous for furniture making, and furniture making went away from the town, and now it is the pizza town, and they produce, I cannot remember how many truckloads a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, of frozen pizzas going around all over the country. It's, it's absolutely amazing, these huge trucks going out of Stranda. But at the same time, there are also a great number more of Michelin star re restaurants mm -hmm. in, in yes. the Scandinavian countries. In fact, there's one in Trondheim, just 200 miles from the Arctic Circle. Now, that's, that's impressive, I think, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there are really some fine restaurants, yeah. Hey, wait, wait a second, let me get you the mic because otherwise our people online can't. Okay, okay, thank you, Sonia. I wonder if any of you uh, is aware of which restaurant the chefs you showed are associated with, if they still are, just for fun. What is that? The chefs you showed up there, which restaurant? Oh, yes, yes, um, you know, the... Um, 
I would have to Google them because they have, you know, they're, if you Google their names and I can share them with you, you can find out which restaurants they are. Noma is still solid and they've, um, a lot of, they fed a lot of their chefs to other programs that launched from Noma. So they've just expanded. Oh no, I don't think so. I'm sorry. Yeah. Is that one that you went to? Were you at Geranium? Uh, yeah, it's, one that, it's the one that's okay, really okay. number one now. Very good. I was talking to my, I'll, I'll tell, it, we, we're both from Denmark, so of course we're very proud of it. I mean, Denmark is now has the two top restaurants in the world. They're both three star Michelin. And last year, Noma was number one, and mm -hmm. Geranium was number two. This year, they changed. Uh, and the reason good. they actually changed, Norma is closing down. Mm -hmm. He's moving out. He'll come back, no doubt, somewhere yeah. else with someone different. But Geranium decided to throw out all red meats and everything with chicken. And so the only f protein they serve would be fish oh, wow. or, or, you know, crustacean mm -hmm. or right. fish dishes. And the people who, who did the most said, this is so fantastic that they have to do that today, throwing out all the meats which people in America would die to eat and would come to Denmark be upset they don't get it. But they have, they're now under the world's best restaurant, the three stars. And I mean, it costs you $800 to eat there. Oh that includes the wines, but oh good. You, you have an experience apparently. I'm not, could, I hadn't afforded it yet, but there's, the, I mean, we have people there, they say it's just incredible what they serve. And as you said, there's, there's chefs at Norma are allowed to leave the restaurant with the recipes they develop themselves. Normally chefs don't, subject don't do that, they keep it for themselves. And they've started a range of fantastic restaurants which serves at a fifth of the price of Norma, more or less the same food, and it's really fantastic. Very so good. So go to Copenhagen and you'll see the people coming there from overseas eating Danish food, or Nordic, you know, the new modern Nordic kitchen. Very exciting. There's a question behind you, Sonia. I was wondering what herbs are most often used in Scandinavian cooking as I'm planning my garden for the oh, spring. Good. Well, dill is definitely on the list. Yeah, uh, cardamom, there a, yes. ginger, parsley. Um, Wasn't there as a, a chervil, or I remember a, a fish dish that I was making for a class, and we don't have it in the United States, or at least I couldn't find it, but that was um, something that Alberta said, well, it's similar to a parsley, so that's what mm -hmm. I used, but I think that would be another, or is it Angelica? Angelica. I think it's Angelica, Angelica. not chervil. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does anyone know where to get um, dill that is slow to bolt? My sister-in-law in Finland grows dill, and it just keeps dilling all summer long. But when I grow it, it you know, within a week it has bolted, and the, and the season is over. Uh, and Mary, I, I, she I has a different kind. I figured out how not to get it to bolt. Um, some, yeah, well, sometimes it depends on our weather. Oops, sorry. Um, sometimes it depends on our weather, but I do it succession. So I plant some and then let that take off and then I plant oh. more. And so that way I'm harvesting. Um, I try and grow enough for us to use for the year and share with friends and family. Because it's dried and, yep. and uh, frozen. Is, yep. I love it fresh in the summer, yeah, so I, I use as then. much of it that way as I can. Um, but then I dry whatever so I can use the flavor dried throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Pardon? I don't know. That's a question for me. I don't know the answer. You know, I, I think there's one other observation I would make. Uh, we were talking earlier with someone that a lot of folks think if it's Nordic, it's kind of homogenous, it's all the same. But the countries really have a very different, just like the people are different, the landscape is different, the people, uh, the uh, foods are different. There are a lot of similarities. You know, cardamom bread is, everybody has cardamom bread. Um, and all the countries seem to have some version of a fish soup, although it's slightly different if you're in Norway or if you're in Finland. Um, so that there are distinctive differences in the foods in the countries, 
Mm -hmm. uh, as well as people being different. Some of them are regional differences too. Um, one of the things, um, you know, here in the United States, whenever I've had lefsa, it's always been potato <laughs> lefsa. Well, in the area that I'm from, my family was from Sona Fjordana, um, is uh, not, it was hardanger lefsa, mm -hmm. which is more of a buttermilk base that doesn't use potatoes. And they used to spread, they'd spread butter, but then um, my aunts would tell me that, well, actually you can purchase it at the store now in Norway, I've never seen it here, um, but it's called gombe that takes unpasteurized milk and just cooks it down for hours and it comes out to this beautiful, sweet uh, spread and mm. oh my goodness, it's good and they put that on the hardanger less so, but that's a complete regional thing as well as the other, but then I also mentioned with the, um, the pea soup earlier, you know, the finish, it's the uh, dried whole green beans, Swedish is more more of the um, yellow peas. And so it just, even though some of the things are very similar, they they have the same type of thing, but with little regional changes. But in addition, there's very definite things that are Danish, are Norwegian, are Swedish, are Icelandic, etc. cetera, Finnish. Yeah. And, and cheese is another good example of that. Yeah. E each of the countries as most of you know, have some very distinctive cheeses, um, very, very different from one another. Um, and the cheese that comes from uh, the Valley of Gudbrandal in Norway, where my grandmother was from, they came up with Jetost, which is the sometimes called brown cheese. It's very sweet, and um, it's very unusual, and it's, <laughs> it's only made there, as far as I know. Um, and it seemed like... Yeah, well, processed. Processed that I was talking about, too. I saw you wrinkle up your nose with the with the uh, Yedos. My children, when they were growing up, I said, oh, you guys, it tastes like caramel. It's so good. So they both tried it. Oh, <laughs> that's not caramel, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I had a question that I, it kind of occurred to me while we were talking. And Barb, maybe you've come across this, but with climate change, do you see them making any adjustments? I think they are adjusting all the time because that's part of their local, eating local focus. And especially when they're foraging, if they're not able to find those lichens or those mushrooms or whatever they're looking for, you know, that's, that is definitely something that's real for us to, to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yep. I have friends in Sweden and we stayed with them uh, some summers ago and we happened to be lucky enough to be there during chanterelle season and they went out and picked chanterelles but they would not allow us to go with them because they said it's a secret and we don't want even you to know because our neighbors might try and come to you and ask us where the chanterelles are. So, so uh, we feasted on them for like three days in three different recipes and we were like in seventh heaven and we said we will hold the secret <laughs> <laughs> any other questions comments well we thank you so much for coming tonight and thank you from the cook and eat committee for your presentation if you're interested in ever taking one of their classes, keep your eye on our nordicnorthwest.org website because the tickets for those classes sell out almost instantly. Uh, if, you, if you're not there on the day that it goes online, um, you may not have a chance to go. <laughs> There's typically the uh, second Tuesday of the month, except for December, June, July, and August. Right. And we tend to keep the classes a little bit smaller. Um, if we go up to 30, that's a big class. The only really big thing that we will do, um, well, we've done a couple. We've done mm -hmm. the wine tasting and food, uh, food pairing, the Akavit tasting, mm -hmm. where those classes were larger. When we do the culinary class in May, that will definitely be a large class and more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is a treat. The classes are a treat. They're just a, they're fun to do, and and to the extent they're hands on, it's uh, you really feel like you're getting the fingers in in the flour. So that's mm -hmm. that's a lot of fun. Yeah. And like Priscilla said, you know, we're going to cook this wonderful food and then we get to sit down together and eat it right mm -hmm. then and there. Mm -hmm. It's a lot, absolutely a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.